station has a totally professional station. Warren Aldi, Warren Aldi is a former TV news guy. Is he? Have you, oh, you met him, huh? Wow. Okay, we're going to go. Okay, we're good. Let's oh, okay, we're good. Okay, quite a sec. And we have one final question here as I, as I thank all of you for coming here tonight. And uh, please go ahead in the uh, back. Favorite? Oh boy, that is a, oh, that's a very good question. I'm going to date myself a little bit here because I did spend five years in Bakersfield, and just before I left, or rather, just before they left me go, which does happen unfortunately in television too, even if you've been there like five years. Uh, I had been there about three and a half years, and my wife and I decided, well, you know, Bakersfield. Anybody here from Bakersfield, by the way? Because I hate to diss Bakersfield if anybody's from the town. Oh, thank you very much. It, Oh, so, oh, Sweden. Oh, Stockholm, one of my favorite towns. Um, but uh, <laughs> anybody here from the French Riviera? No, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, I was in, for, in Bakersfield, and uh, it's actually very nice people. I truly do, but it's just hot and miserable. No culture, but anyway. So I, my wife and I decided that when we wanted to cool down, we would just go over to Cambria, or Cambria, as the locals call it, over on the Central Coast. My, my late aunt uh, was living over there, so we'd go visit her and cool off and stuff. So we thought, let's start a family. Let's get the house, and you could buy houses, you know, dirt cheap back in those days in Bakersfield. Probably still can today for that matter, for obvious reasons, but I won't go into that right now. So we bought a house, started up a family, and about six months into this whole process, you know, Ryan was just a little boy, uh, they decide that they don't want me anymore. They'll let me go. And, but you know, that, that's what happens. Uh, so um, there's a point to the story. <laughs> Oh, that's our interview. So as part of my exit strategy, they, they decide, and this does happen, by the way, so another reason why you need to be versatile. They said, well, we're going we're gonna to hire a new nighttime guy, but you know, people in this town really do like you, and that's true. I had a good following and stuff. So we don't want to just cut you loose. That would look kind of weird. So if you promise not to talk about this on, on the air, we're going to put you on the morning show and the noon show and, and give you about six months to find another job which is pretty unheard of in broadcasting. Usually they just cut you out and don't say anything there, you're gone, you know. But, but we had a relationship, people liked it there and stuff. They, they knew I was gonna do that. So I said, oh, well, I hate to, you know, lose the job, but I'll go ahead and just uh, live under those uh, parameters. So I was on the morning show. And actually it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I was, my dream was not to be a weather guy and talk about, you know, high pressure and low pressure and uh, air temperature tomorrow and all that, ISO bars and all that kind of stuff. I liked interviewing people, I liked doing shtick. I like doing live shots. So every morning, they'd almost let me do anything I wanted. I mean, it was really, it was pretty bizarre, some of the stuff I did. One was, I was out downtown where Buck Owens was doing a concert. Anybody ever heard of Buck Owens? Uh, I'm, oh, my, oh, dating myself again, aren't I? Yeah, oh, man. Very, very popular country western artist. Bakersfield, actually, do we have any country music fans? Let's put it that way. Oh, wow, you've never heard of Buck Owens? Okay, your homework assignment? YouTube Buck Owens. <laughs> Because, no, he's very, I mean, anybody in country music that's just, maybe just a little bit older than you are would know the name. He was more classic country. Classic country. And Buck Owens essentially started what is known as the Sound of Bakersfield. He and Merle Haggard, who's another classic name you've probably never heard of, but these are two giants in the industry. Uh, Buck in those days was kind of getting close to the end. He's got a TV station up there in Bakersfield. He's got at least one radio station, maybe two. And I actually interviewed Buck Owens on the air. Who was, you know, of course, Buck Owens in Bakersfield would be like, I don't know, what's the analog here in Santa Monica? I'm trying, who's a, a famous person? There you go, Ryan Seacrest. Although well, maybe not for Santa Monica, but just because he's big here in Southern California. What's that? Carson Daly? Yeah. Is he from Santa Monica? Oh, perfect. Like Carson Daly. Perfect. Oh, perfect example. So there, and so everybody's, oh my God, there's Buck Owens. Wow, there he is. Kind of thing. So I, I went over, took the stick, microphone. He go, hey, Buck, nice. Thanks for taking a few minutes. You know, uh, how's it going? And he says, uh, oh, re really good. How are, how are things going over there at uh, Channel 23? <laughs> Why? Well, you know, I, I work for Channel 29. And I, you know, I'm trying to be real subtle, be nice to this elderly man. He's probably in his 80s. And so, oh, I, I hear pretty well. I'm pretty good at Channel 29, too. All right, <laughs> Mike Flight, Channel 29. It's a very subtle move there. But uh, anyway, he's probably the most uh, famous. Other than, yeah, Drew Bledsoe. Yeah. I did have a congressman who's probably dead now, unfortunately. Famous congressman. Politician. That, politician who I can't even think of the name of. Uh, yeah, exactly. In, uh, in Bakersfield. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other really big, can you think of any big dames interviewed? I'm trying to think of other, uh, I probably would have told you about it if I did. Um, gosh, that's a, such a good question. If I, if I had thought about it, I should have thought of that before I came in. Well, Next year, I'll remember, I'll think of some other names. Buckham is probably the most famous, but, you know, of a certain, you know, certain age or whatever. Uh, but no, thank you very much for asking the, uh, the personality angle. Now, I think, uh, no. should we take a... Let's
short little uh, costume yeah, break let's here. Just and wrap it up. Once again, let's hear for Gary Butterworth. Oh, Gary well. Yeah, he's spending his time with uh, his take on the business. It's a good uh, inside and some good outside, so to speak, yeah. as well. And the Giants winning has made it even better. So no, perfect no. timing, perfect timing. Right, good. So, uh, uh, so quick, little, quick little costume change here. Be right yeah. back. And yeah. uh, thank you in advance again for hanging out for a few minutes. I, I really do appreciate that. I yeah. hope this will be, be worth your while. In fact, maybe Mike can explain what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as I'm out, like, I'll put yeah, the uh, first stuff. slide up here. I'll get my uh, stuff all ready to go. And, um, uh, Let's see, where is my speaking of my stuff? You go, and you can go for yourself. So just two people are leaving because they have a thing to do. Out of here. Um, so do you want me to give you like a so, timer like when you're on 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah what do you do? Give, give, me, give me like, yeah, give me, or just actually to begin. Here we go. Give me three, two, one. Good evening. I'm Mel Weather Lewis. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm a captain in the U.S. Army. But more than that, I'm an explorer. Ever since I was a little boy, I wanted to go exploring, just like my heroes, Captain Clark and Captain Cook. Oh, and by the way, how can we forget about Christopher Columbus, too? I had one other person that was a big person in my life, believe it or not, someone else you might have heard of. His name is Thomas Jefferson. That's right, President Jefferson was actually a neighbor of mine when I was growing up as a boy in the Piedmont, the mountains right there in Virginia. Do you know that President Jefferson had his eye on me at a very young age? And when I came of age, he invited old Mern here, that's my nickname, Mern. He invited old Mern here to join him in the president's house as his personal assistant paid me out of his own pocket to do so. So President Jefferson and I definitely had a bond. In fact, both of our lives were about to change quite a bit on this date right here. It's a date I'll never forget. June 20, 1803. There I am coming in the door and President Jefferson, where well, he's got some news for me. Your job will be to command the Corps of Discovery to find the best land route to the Pacific. You will map the land's topography and note its plants, animal, and mineral resources. You will bring this government into touch with the Indians of the West. Happy to do so, sir. Only one, one condition, Mr. President, one condition, if I may. And that is, as much as I hate to say it, I know old Mern here, I can't do it alone. I need a partner. I need some help. And so there's only one person I can think of that would be the appropriate person to join Mern on this amazing journey connecting the two coasts here in America. And it'd be this man right here. That's right, the old redhead himself. There he is, Mr. William Clark. And so I actually asked Mr. Clark, who by the way used to be my boss when I was in the army before I joined the president, and I asked Mr. Clark, would you sir please join me? And so this is what uh, Captain Clark said, we have the spirit of Captain Clark here. You have to listen real closely, or it might not catch it. Captain Clark, consider it done. Let's go west and not look back until we hit the Pacific Ocean. And you know what? That's exactly what we did. We decided we're on the threshold of discovery. There I am saying goodbye to my family here. Here's Captain Clark down here. That man down there, 
That's Captain Clark's slave. He brought his slave along. His name was York. York. Now, we took journals along the way. Otherwise, we, you, we, I wouldn't be standing here right now. There'd be no story to talk about. So we were instructed by President Jefferson to write down the story of our journey. And that's exactly what I did right here. So we have our journals. We're all ready to go. The shakedown run happens on May 14, 1804. There's our keelboat right there. In fact, that keelboat right there is about 55 foot long, 8 feet wide. And we had some pirogues out of the shot there, out of the picture, that were also part of the journey. So our very first day, we started later in the afternoon, just in case anything would go wrong, we could go back, start over again. So through the power of the magic lantern right here, see that magic lantern up there? I've got some other images I'd like to show you from my trip, if you'd, if you'd like to see them. Will that be all right? I'll show you. I'm not exactly sure that they all <laughs> see these images, but we'll go ahead and show you a couple here from my... There we go. I see a few hands going up back there. Very nice. Makes old Mun feel really good about that. So what we did was we started around, and I said, Hey, stop, folks. Stop, Captain Clark. And I had him stop the keelboat right around the bend there. And because I'm the explorer that I am, I decided to go up above this cabin up here. And just as I was starting to walk down with my faithful dog, Seaman, Seaman behind me here, my, my foot, started to slip a little bit. That knife right there, that saved the entire voyage. It would have ended right there without me and that knife there. Of course, I had a few outdoor skills build up. Old Moon was trained pretty well to survive outdoors, but that knife well, let's just put it this way. It wouldn't have been the Lewis and Clark trip if it had been the Clark trip. And I, I, I look up to my friend, my good Captain Clark, but I think the two of us needed to be together to really make this thing work. And there we are. We're on the Big Muddy there, boys and girls. That Big Muddy there is so named because all of the tributary rivers that feed into the Big Muddy, often very little streams, sometimes not any thicker than maybe a half an inch, taking a lot of silt and mud being forced down, coalescing, if you will, right into that Missouri. And by the way, do you notice which direction we're going? Are we going uphill or downhill? We're going uphill in the Missouri. So big muddy, uphill, very difficult back breaking work there. We used pulls, we used pulleys, we had ropes. We would get out and push and pull and tug, whatever we had to do, sometimes only a couple miles a day, depending on which way the wind was blowing. If the wind was blowing from behind, we could move along pretty nicely. Often, unfortunately, it was not. What's the first Native American tribe we encountered? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because what we did was, we found the Missouri and the Otto. Very, very nice Indians, if I must say. But old Mern here was a little bit nervous about this one because it was going to be the first speech. I have a copy of it right here that I delivered, but more on that in just a second here. So here it is. We started right down here in St. Louis right there. I believe uh, some of those... Birds from St. Louis that are red colored. I, I don't recall the name of those birds. Anybody here have to remember what those birds are called in St. Louis? They're red. And I, think, I think it's a, oh yeah, I think it's a cardinal. I, for some reason I seem to remember that. So we came right up the river here, right up the Missouri, into this Otto and Missouri River here. And by the way, the night before was a very special night. My good friend Captain Clark celebrated his birthday and he documented it too. And if you listen real closely, you might hear Captain Clark. Talk about that night. Not sure how well you heard the spirit of Clark. He was talking about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes were some of the worst enemies we had on that trip. Horrible, horrible, horrible. That's all I can say. But we're all set now for the military dress parade. Let's get ready because old Moon here is about ready to make his speech. We're all ready to go. These are the red children down here that, that President Jefferson has sent us out. Uh, to talk to. In fact, where's my speech? It's right here. I gave the speech many times. It was well rehearsed. It was well practiced with President Jefferson. It went <clears throat> just like this. Children, 
We have been sent by the great chief of the 17 great nations of America to inform you that a great council was lately held between this great chief and your old fathers, the French and the Spaniards. It was decided that the Missouri River country now belongs to the United States, so that all those who live in that country, whether white or red, are bound to obey the commands of their great chief, the president, who is now your only great father. The great chief has commanded us to give you his good advice, to point out to you the road in which you must walk to obtain happiness. Children, you should not block or obstruct in any way the passage of any boat carrying white men ever. That was the speech. I delivered very proud of that speech too. In fact, we were all set for the peace medal ceremony. This was a tradition that we did with these tribes as we would stop occasionally along the Missouri River. This is actually the sail from our keel boat here. And you can see Captain Clark and me back there getting ready to hand out the peace medals. This is what they look like. There's our president right there. There's the back of the peace medal, a very symbolic uh, gesture of friendship. But what was really interesting, in fact, what was more than interesting, this is the thing the Indians enjoyed the most. You know what the Indians thought this was? When old man took out his air rifle and he cocked it like so, squeezed the trigger. They thought it was magic. The Indians loved it. They couldn't understand it. There's no spark. There's no fire. There's no smoke. How could you fire a gun with only air? I don't know, but that's just what we did. In fact, here's what we did. We encountered the Teton Sioux, ladies and gentlemen, right on our way up the Missouri River, one of our last stops here, by the way, before we wind up my presentation here. In fact, in Clark's journal, he talked about the terrible fight that happened because the Tetons were very aggressive Indians, unlike the Otto and the Missouri, and everything was nearly over. In fact, I almost had to give the order to do this. Fortunately, that never had to happen. We never had to fire on those Indians, or that would have been the very end of our trip up the river. We were definitely not outgunned. We had more weapons, but not nearly as many men. And fortunately, it had a very good ending here. In fact, uh, Sergeant uh, Ordway here actually described it here in the journals as we wrap up our presentation. And let me just briefly read this to you, what Ordway said on September 25, 1804. He wrote, Captain Clark told them that we were sent by their great father, the president of the U.S., and that if they misused us, that he or Captain Lewis could, by writing to him, have them all destroyed, as it were, in a moment. Then Chief let go the cable and said he was sorry. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me stop there in my presentation because... I have a feeling I've given you a lot of information here about our trip, and you may have some more questions about our trip, perhaps how it went, what you saw here. Old Nun here is available to answer some questions. So please, if I may, I'll put on my coonskin cap here and definitely answer those questions. I'd be happy to. Anybody have a question for Mayor Weller Lewis here? Can I? Oh, please, yes, yes, young lady, right here, yes. Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, Clark, uh, so far as I know, uh, now keep in mind, some of you may not know this about me, but I died just a few years after the trip. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, Clark did not get his freedom, did not get his freedom during my lifetime. Uh, it's a very good question. How about another one over here? Yeah, I, I'm always thinking about eating, so I'm curious, what did you guys eat on the journey? Oh, that's a great question. This surprises some people when they've asked me about this. You know, it sort of depended on where we were. Now, we came from the St. Louis area there. We used to call that the Upper Missouri River area there. But what we liked most was flesh. We liked deer. Our delicacy for us was beaver tail. Matter of fact, that's why we were on the mission. Many people don't know that. They thought it was strictly a military mission. It was not. We were not there looking for gold or silver or precious metals. We wanted trading furs. That's what we're looking for. They wanted beaver tail. 
That's what the money was. So we wanted to start a trading empire with the Indians and boot the British out and let us take over the trading empire from coast to coast. And that was the whole idea here. So what did we eat? Kind of interesting story here. We had a lot of provisions initially on the trip, but as we started moving along the Columbia River up there in the great Pacific Northwest, we ran out of provisions, as you might imagine. And we were forced to eating what the natives ate. And what the natives like up there is fish, salmon. I don't hate salmon, but the men and me, we wanted flesh. So you know we ended up eating most of the time in the Pacific Northwest? Not elk, not beaver, not deer, because they weren't very plentiful. We ended up eating dogs. We traded trinkets with the Indians for dogs. That's what the men wanted more than anything else, because it's the only meat that was available. They got tired of salmon. So most of the time on the trip, it was dog because it was flesh. Now, the dog that you might think of today may not be the same sort of, you know, dog that you're thinking of back then in terms of your relationship, but there was an Indian, maybe you were about to ask me this, there was one Indian on our way back, well, our tempers get a little, little, uh, little tested here. One Indian stole my dog, Seaman, that black dog, and I warned him and his village, and I was serious when I said this, that I'd have burnt that thing to the ground if I didn't see my dog in an hour, and I would have too. And luckily within the hour, somehow the dog showed up. So seamen, seaman, my dog was off limits, but everybody else, they're hungry, they eat whatever they want. That's a very good question. Now folks, I'm gonna go to act three right now. So I'm gonna kind of go like this to act three. I'm gonna take off my costume here and begin to sort of speak. Oop, I guess I'll leave him back. I don't know what I think about. And talk more in my voice, my normal voice, as the scholar <coughs> of Meriwether Lewis. And so now I'm not playing the character anymore. I'm speaking to you as a scholar. And I want to correct one question, if I can, that just came up that I couldn't answer because I wasn't alive to know. Did York get his freedom? He did, eventually. But York did, uh, York's owner, Clark, did not want to give it to him. In fact, York, can you believe this now? Do you understand? York was one of the men of the Corps. He was gone three years. He worked just as hard, if not harder, than anybody else on that trip. He begged for his freedom when he got back. Clark wouldn't give it to him. And finally, he decided, Clark decided to give in because York's wife was living in another county in Kentucky. And he finally very grudgingly said, okay, I guess I'll, I'll let you go. And keep in mind now, York, you don't know this, but uh, York and Clark grew up together. So he was the family slave, and they knew each other very well. You might even say they were friends. How about, a, how about one more question, maybe, as the scholar, and then we'll wrap things up here. Yeah? Uh, did Lewis commit suicide, or was he murdered? Oh, that is the question everybody wants to know. You know, we don't know for sure. I, I can tell you what most of the historians would say is that he committed suicide. That's what most of the evidence points to. But there is no real definitive answer. Um, he was buried outside of Grinder's Stand, which is this little kind of backwater, uh, you know, lodging area on the Natchez Trace. Any of you familiar with the Trace? Maybe down there in the south, uh, just outside of, uh, outside of uh, Tennessee. And uh, there is a school of thought now, and I, I think some of it, it just sounds more exciting to think that he was murdered. Uh, I, I don't really see any real evidence of that, but there have been some scholars suggest that maybe he was murdered, and they sort of get into all the, you know, the, 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 the Masonic temple, and they have all these, you know, kind of wild things that we might call conspiracy theories, but the rallies we really don't know. There are some other theories, though, besides uh, committing suicide. That's the one that's, that most scholars point to. There is, a, there is a theory, a very serious theory, that he died of malaria, because he had malaria, we know that, but there's another theory, another theory, another theory is that he might have died of syphilis, because many of the men, now, the, the story goes that Clark and uh, Ann Lewis abstained the entire voyage. That's, that's what we're supposed to believe. But there is one Indian, apparently, in history. I forget which tribe it was now, but looked an awful lot like Clark. Because, see, Clark lived to about 70 years of age. The Lewis character committed suicide about four years. He, he just couldn't. Well, I say he committed suicide. We think he committed suicide. Uh, but so those are, the, those are the areas. Folks, you've been a great audience. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks again for coming. Appreciate it. I'll, I'll turn it over here to my Svengali, Professor Carlucci over here. Thanks right, again guys, for coming. Thank you for hanging out.